to use them, examples of them, um, planning, and so that'll be the second portion. So uh, mine draws on several sources that are generally uh, noted on the slides. Doug Tallamy's work is and in influences throughout. Uh, he is an entomology professor at Delaware. He's written several very influential books on this. One of them is called Bringing Nature Home and the other is called Nature's Best Hope. So if you're interested, I would highly recommend those two books as excellent references. Uh, I will try to use a virtual presentation format to engage you. Uh, this is my first attempt at that. I hope it will work. Um, my objectives in this 45 minute section, and it should take about that, is uh, to provide each of you with a better understanding of how essential your home and community landscaping is to nature. And if you're not already inclined, I hope you will become committed towards the use of nature's natives in your home and becoming an advocate to your friends and neighbors. I think we all have a real fundamental connection to nature as being interested in master, master naturalist. I'm sure you're all aware of that. Uh, but I want to just kick off by listening to a couple of bird calls. And uh, if you would just uh, maybe close your eyes and think what, where you think these are take you, you know, or, you know, maybe if you have some emotion that comes up, what those are. We'll see if, if this part works. I haven't tried it before. We'll see if it'll work. That's call one. Okay, the, the first call was, um, <laughs> second one isn't over. Okay, the, fir the first call is uh, Red Shoulder Knock. And for me, uh, it, uh, it, it reminds me of my retirement home uh, here in spring and um, I kind of have a feeling of uh, freedom. Uh, and the second one is a Western Meadowlark, unless you come from the west of here or further north, you probably are not familiar with it, but it's, uh, for me, it reminds me of where I was raised in Western Kansas and it's kind of the, uh, brings up feeling of peaceful mornings or evenings, you'll often hear it there. And uh, both of the, these uh, birds, the number of them have, have uh, declined dramatically, but I, I'll get into that in a second. But uh, <clears throat> I'm going to be talking a lot about the science of why na natives um, and um, I hope that, that uh, this doesn't bother anybody in your relig religious beliefs, uh, but I will be talking about that. But for those with, you know, that are Christian, I often think about the, this quote from Genesis about Lord uh, took man and put him in the Garden of Eden to work it and keep it. Uh, that I think is quite wise and what is expected us of, and of this uh, earth that we inherited. Um, and I'll be talking a lot about time scale and the importance of, of uh, coevolution. And so to get our heads wrapped around that time scale, uh, think of the four and a half billion years that the earth has been evolving as the distance from your left hand, uh, tip of it, if you, I don't know if you can see me on the screen, probably not, but all the way to your right hand, okay? so that. Think of that as being four and a half billion years from your outstretched arms, from your left hand to your right hand. Where do you think in that, um, in that time scale, when you start of the um, formation of the earth on your left hand, where across that would, would complex life start? And that's, um, more than single sail, it's not on the on land yet. But and you know, put your guests in the chat. You know, when you think that life started, 
And I'll show you, see if I can do that. I'm not gonna unshare, but if you can see me right here, uh, it's kind of coming in and out, not real good. Sorry about that. Let me see if I can get it here. That's, that's the, a fossilized form of an anth anthropod that's called a trilobite that would be one of those complex li life forms. All right, so the answer is that that complex life started would be on your right hand, right at your wrist, okay? So, uh, you know, a lot of that time was in developing our atmosphere and conditions for life, very simple life forms. And this is really when complex life started. Man and our species, uh, now, <clears throat> when, they, when we uh, began, could be removed by a single scrape of a fingernail file on one of your fingers on the right hand. So the point is that man's um, time in interaction with this complex ecosystem environment that we live in is very recent. And our impact um, has only began, been very recent in man's history. This is a graph that shows estimated population uh, on one side and then starts with uh, about 12,000 years ago or 10,000 BC uh, when Homo sapiens had, had reached all the continents but Antarctica, we'd started farming and uh, the population estimates were about a, a million people. And as you see the graph, it's it's slowly increases and then it has this rapid inflection point. And where that occurs is at the time of the industrial revolution. Uh, there we have machines to power agriculture and commerce and human population really exploded. We got up to a billion people in uh, 1800. We're currently uh, in excess of seven and a half billion over my lifetime, um, the population has increased threefold. And that's a lot of mouths to feed. Um, and our impact on the environment has become, it is related to our population. Um, when we will get peak uh, population uh, is just forecast, uh, the UN thinks it will, or their forecast is that it'll, that it'll stabilize around 11 billion and peak child population is already peaked at about 2 billion. So there's some promising signs that this uh, really explosive population growth is already um, um, subsiding. Uh, and there's the references on the screen. About half of the arable land uh, has been converted um, to cropland, and a good part of the other has been converted to pasture land. And if you visit a native prairie or and a uh, a native um, a, a, and a typical pasture in the same ecosystem, they're remarkably different. Um, a pasture is really predominantly uh, invasives or, or at least a turf grass that's been brought in to support heavy grazing, at least uh, in US and in, and in Europe. And the, the amount of wildlife supported by a pasture is remarkably different than a native grassland. This is a graph that, that shows um, the makeup of how we've converted U.S. lower 48 lands. Uh, the big three are to crops, to grassland and forestry. I have another slide a little bit about that. But uh, the best estimate, estimate is there's only three to 5% of the land in the lower 48 remains in an undisturbed habitat for nature. And this is the graph that shows um, how that 
uh, land is has been used. See the timberland is on your left side of the screen. Um, the far right is by area uh, um, urbanized. Uh, a little bit more about that later. Um, between pasture land and farmland, we've devoted about 41% of our land to livestock, which is the largest, biggest, the, the largest single category. Uh, the U.S. is becoming much more urban. We're adding about a million acres a year uh, for urban area, and that's the equivalent of adding the area of Los Angeles, Phoenix, and Houston each year. Um, now just bringing a little bit closer to home, this is a, um, two images, these are Google Earth images that are South Montgomery County. Um, it's an area six miles by four miles. Uh, in both of these images, they're taken exactly the same place, um, but 17 years apart. And as you see in 2002, uh, that was largely forested. Um, that's the piney woods ecosystem that I live in. That's the significance of this uh, particular photograph is it's centered on my house. Um, if you look 17 years later on the left, you can see Spring Creek that runs through it. And that um, forested area is the uh, Spring Creek Re Reserves. Uh, and everything else other than a part to the very far north and uh, what east uh, has been urbanized. And that's over a 17 year period. So let me pause there and um, Scott, are there any questions that have come up or should I just keep going? I was trying to unmute unsuccessfully, Mike, and I got it. <clears throat> so, no, no questions have come in on the chat room. If anybody wants to unmute, if you have a question, please chime in or else we'll proceed. I think we proceed, Mike. Okay. There is a relationship between area uh, for habitat and the number of species that can be supported or will evolve in that, in that area. Uh, this is fairly well established uh, over a couple hundred years of, of environmental science. And the basic relationship is that the number of species is related to um, the habitat area raised to a power. So it's a logarithmic relationship. This shows an example of that. Um, this shows the number of fresh water uh, species against, plotted against the area. You see the larger continents of Africa, South America, South East Asia have um, between 1,000 and 10,000 freshwater species. And down here, Hawaii looks like it's about three or four. And in between we have smaller or larger islands like Madagascar and New Guinea, Guinea. And there are literally hundreds of correlations like this that you could find that are plotting out that show this area relationship. Um, this makes sense if you think about it. And if you think about it in terms of speciation, what happens, and if I relate it to like a, a bank balance, if we Look at what is my bank balance at the end of a period is whatever I started with plus deposits I made less what spent in a species that would be what we have at an end of, is an end of a period is whatever you start with plus species that are created speciation and then species that went extinct. So extinction over a larger area should be lower because We've got a bigger population spread over a wider area so that it's less susceptible to predation, uh, diseases, or climate changes, droughts that, that uh, could cause uh, extinction over a small and more apt to over a smaller area with fewer uh, numbers. 
speciation should be greater. So the adding to our number over a larger area. When we think about that, there's over a larger area, there's gonna be more, more barriers. Uh, and so you, you have um, more likelihood of populations that are isolated where mutations that can occur that are better adapted to local conditions that can lead to a new, a new species. So uh, in both area and in both extinction and speciation, larger areas should uh, reduce extinction, increase speciation. We have a great example of that that happened with the building of the Panama Canal. When they built the lake to service the canal in 1914, there was a mountaintop that became a, uh, an island and it also became a, a nature preserve that's protected by international treaty. So it's a great um, um, place to study what occurs as you get local isolation. And uh, the number of species, they don't think it has come to equilibrium yet, but in a little over 100 years, this 30, over this 3,700 acre preserve, some 50 to 80 of the bird species, these are non-migratory bird species have disappeared. About 6% of the butterfly species have disappeared and all of the cat species have disappeared. And this is in a protected preserve. So this is a, a, a good demonstration of this um, area species relationship. It, <clears throat> the US conservation um, really started in the late 1800s with uh, our first national parks and then subsequently state parks. Uh, we've had a Wilderness Act and then a, an Endangered Species Act that was passed in 1973. And that Endangered Species Act has about a little over 2,000 endangered plants and animals currently. And it's been good at, um, at stopping extinctions, or relatively good. There's only been 10 listed that have subsequently gone extinct. Um, and a few have been delisted, most famously is the bald eagle through preservation um, of habitat and a number of, uh, of other uh, laws to preserve, uh, in fact, all raptors. But it's not been good at trying to get them delisted. So uh, we have a lot of species that kind of stay on the brink. Um, but the, all of the US strategy has really been towards having a strategy to preserve nature in uh, isolated habitats like park, uh, parks and preserves. Well, there's several limitations with that strategy. Uh, there's a limited uh, area currently uh, that's been set up for that and there's a lot of data that says that there's not enough connectivity between these, at least for the big um, predators like uh, grizzly bears as a, an example. Um, to, um, and it takes a lot of active management. Our arable ecosystems are underrepresented. This shows uh, state, uh, major state and uh, uh, national parks. And also that, that globally, extinction rates are hundreds of times greater what the, than what the natural uh, uh, extinction rate would be. And <clears throat> uh, the US global, the UN, excuse me, global assessment report shows that there are thousands of species, uh, or, excuse me, a million species worldwide that are facing extinction and about uh, half of that are land species, species that lack sufficient land for their long-term survival. Um, <clears throat> the London Zoological Society and the World, World Wildlife Fund, it's difficult for me to get my uh, mouth around that, has developed an index that monitors some 4,392 in uh, vertebrate species 
um, that they have data on that go back to 1970. And just uh, coincidentally, I would mention that the Audubon Christmas um, bird count, which several members of the Hartwood chapter participate, participate in, and some of the areas are actually led by Hartwood chapter members. That's part of the data that this WWF uses for coming up with this index. So <clears throat> since 1970 and up to 2016, there's been a 68% decline in the number of these uh, vertebrate species uh, in just total numbers. Um, that it's largest in, actually in uh, the tropics in the Caribbean. And there's data where they have data to see what's the cause. Um, they have estimated it for all of the different land areas and the, the data um, of possible causes are shown um, uh, um, on your screen. A being land use, B could be, it was another one is over exploitation, invasive disease, pollution and climate change. So what do you think, and put it in your chat, is the primary cause of decline in population of wildlife in North America? And what do you think is the, the least? So you can use the letters A through E, but first your primary, cause and secondly, what you think is the least cause. So I'll give you a minute to do that. Okay, so these are the percentages. So by far the largest in this kind of um, supported by what I've talked about so far in land use and loss of habitats largest. They're actually in uh, order. Uh, climate change is the smallest. Uh, that's climate change that has occurred um, to date. There's an expectation that this will increase over time if climate change continues, but that's what the percentages are with the data they have um, through 2016. This is another graph that shows a uh, decline of uh, bird population. It's from a, a study that was published um, in 2019. It shows that about 3 billion birds have been lost in um, North America since the year 1970. On the far right, if you can see this, the largest number is grassland uh, biomes, where it's uh, about 60% of, of the grassland birds like the uh, western meadowlark that was we listened to in the beginning. It's dropping about a percent per year. And uh, that's less in other biomes. And there's only one that's been increased. And I think it gives a, a good example of what can be done to uh, reverse that. And that's the wetland biome. Uh, that's water fowl populations have actually increased over this period um, uh, through billions of dollars have been invested in preservation of wetlands, both by private and governmental programs in something they call adaptive harvest management so that the number of permits and allowed uh, uh, harvest is managed adaptively. And among the notable private organizations that have made a key role in this is Ducks Unlimited. Uh, they have conserved more than 14 million acres of habitat since 1937. So, you know, there's a, this is a great example of, of, of what can be done and has been done uh, to preserve uh, birds in wetlands. So, <clears throat> what's the consequences of the loss of species and ecosystem stability? They the, the current thinking is it's sort of like a Jenga puzzle. So you can start taking species out and then, be, and then you get new relationships uh, and different dependencies and you can take them out. But there's a point at which 
you take out too many, then the ecosystem can and will collapse. And there's one cautionary um, example of that, and that's Easter Island. Easter Island is uh, famous for these Maui um, um, statues. Um, the Rapi Nui culture uh, built those. Uh, they had a population on this Easter Island that peaked about 15,000 pe people. And then largely through over-exploitation of the native palm trees uh, that they used for building fishing boats, uh, it's no long, they're no longer in, uh, there on, on the island. And then they imported an invasive rat species. And the combination of those two things led to an ecosystem collapse. And <clears throat> the population uh, went from about 15,000 to some 2,000 people when the Euro Europeans arrived in the 1700s. So there is one cautionary example of, of overstressing an ecosystem. So why does biodiversity matter? Um, as biodiversity goes down, ecosystem stability goes down, and ecosystems provide us all these services that our urban society needs um, to, for a healthy uh, life uh, of, of our planet. And this is soil preservation, carbon se sequestration, pollination plants, controlling floods. You can read them, they're all listed up there. So that seems to me sort of dry. So let's look at something we're all familiar with, which many of us are familiar with Hurricane Harvey in 2017. Some 88 deaths attributed to that. Um, $125 billion of damages, a million automobiles were destroyed, literally thousands and millions of lives were impacted in one form or another. <clears throat> so um, what, how much did you think man's impact on our ecosystems had on increasing Hurricane Harvey flooding? Okay, so that's all impacts. Um, so one possibility is 15%, B would be 50%, C is 85%, and D is 125%. So go ahead and make your guess as to what that um, percentage increase due to Hurricane Harvey, and I'll uh, mention what the source of this. It's a study by this one, Antonio Sebastian, who's associated with both Rice and Texas A&M University. She is one of uh, four of the doctorate uh, um, uh, professors who, who co-authored this study that was issued in 2019. I get the, re the reference up here. And they built models of the ecosystem and or the, the hydrology in 1900. The current hydrology, the uh, history matched the known storms and data. And, and then they ran their model, then they to validate their models, and then they ran Hurricane, uh, hurricane ha Harvey um, with on both cases. So those of you that entered C, 85% have the estimated difference <clears throat> caused by man. So almost doubling it due to what we've done to this local ecosystem. Some of it's global. The first one was uh, the fixing of carbon in plants and soils. The, their, the estimate was a 15% increase in rainfall due to climate change. Uh, there's a number of studies on that. That's sort of at the, towards the lower conservative end. I've seen ones as high as 38%, but they felt very comfortable in supporting 15% more rainfall uh, was caught of that hurricane was caused by the global warming that's occurred. The biggest impact was in peak flooding rate. It increased some 54% by urbanization. Um, and that is an average of over all of the rec recording stations, which they had data for in, 
in this watershed, the um, Buffalo Bayou watershed. And that includes the uh, retention ponds and dams. Um, and this is an average increase in peak flooding rate. Um, they, uh, even downstream of like the Attics Dam, when they ran, ran it at 1900 versus uh, um, model versus the urbanized model, they got higher peak rates with the um, downstream of the dam, not as high as this 54% increase. That's an average of all of their um, stations, but even that increase. So it's almost a doubling from uh, basically man's impact on this ecosystem. So any questions before I move on? I think you're good, Mike. Okay. Now they've been asking some questions on the side in the chat room and between me and Lisa, we've um, thrown out some stuff. All right, cool. Uh, it, this is a very recent study. This is from this year, for, again, from the World Wildlife Fund. It's a living planet report. And what they looked at is this biodiversity loss. Well, what can we recover it? And what happens if we just let it continue? And they showed that uh, if we, if we uh, addressed, excuse me, supply side efforts, demand side efforts and conservation efforts, all of them, then we could get um, our biodiversity numbers up by the end of the 21st century. But you have to work across all of those um, all of those uh, dimensions. Um, supply side includes improvement in agricultural cultural productivity. Um, and a, and in a more trade, uh, we'll go into detail there, but that is basically trying to produce where you can produce most uh, effectively um, without, without barriers and, and just be more productive where we are producing. Uh, demand side includes redu reducing agricultural waste and that's all the way from harvest to consumption. We have a large waste in that system and changes in dietary um, uh, towards more vegetable calories and less meat calories. You, you saw early how, how much of our land is devoted uh, to production of meat in the lower 48 states. And the last category is conservation efforts to provide, uh, prevent additional loss of protected lands and changes that encourage both restoration and better wildlife outcomes for land currently under um, uh, that, that are currently protected. And many of the Hartwood chapter volunteer efforts are focused on supporting increased conservation, whether that's in the Bioland Conservancy, Native Plant Society of Texas, Spring Creek and Ambassador Program, Invasive Removal. Um, a lot of our chapter is devoted toward the conservation end of that. There, there is an evolving strategy for conservation. It's called uh, reconciliation ecology, and it's the idea that we need to uh, establish um, habitats and conserve um, species diversity in places where we live and work. Um, and rather than having this conflict between progress and the environment or our livelihoods, and the environment is figuring out how we can do both. And so grow, growing native plants in our home and gardens is a, is a prime example of reconciliation uh, ecology. And this new approach, um, I'm gonna, I think I'll just skip this slide. Uh, it just shows how we are becoming much more urbanized uh, over time. Um, and I'll move past that. We need native plants um, basically to support life. If we didn't have, not, or plants rather, if we didn't have plants, we wouldn't have oxygen. It's the primary way of converting sun's energy into food. So uh, plants are absolutely essential to life and sustaining life on Earth. 
Insects also play an, a critical role in sustaining life. They're the primary source for transfer of energy from plants to other forms of life. There are the primary herb, herbivores on the planet and they're the food source for 96% of North American terrestrial birds, essential for pollination, for decomposition, and, the, and just a key role in all of our ecosystems. So they are essential. So why do we need native plants? We need native plants because the plants and insects have co-evolved over literally millions of years. So flowering plants first evolved about 125 million years ago. They co-evolved with the pollinators. So if you think about that, that'd be about the, uh, the length of maybe one of your fingers on this timeline. But over a very long time frame, they co-evolved and the Insects are predators to plants, and plants evolve defenses against their primary predators, insects. And then insects would develop countermeasures to overcome those defenses. And the result of this over long periods of co evolution is that most plants are specialized in eating only certain plants that co evolved with them and that they can overcome their defenses. Plants have um, very complex leaf chemistry and quite widely varied. And a lot of that is due to the secondary metabolic chemicals that they have developed to try to defend them against insects. Now, insects come up with enzymes to detoxify those metabolic um, chemicals. And so Plants and insects have adapted synchronized light and the, so that they recognize, the insects recognize what they can eat. And 90% um, of plant eating insects are specialists. So if we have, uh, we need native plants in our uh, ecosystems, in our gardens, in our, in our parks, so that we have um, insects that are there to produce caterpillar and uh, that start that whole web of life for the ecosystem. And that's particularly important uh, for birds. Uh, birds population uh, is dependent upon the, the um, food sources that they have, particularly for their young. And alien plants contribute little to the web of life. So this is a slide that shows some Carolina chickadees. Uh, there's a fledged uh, group that we had from a couple of years ago. <clears throat> that, um, and so the question is, how many insects larvae do you think are needed to raise this clutch from you know, the hatchlings shown up here, to those right before the fledge, I got this picture, I think the day before they fledged. So how many insect large larvae do you think are needed to raise them? I'll give you a minute to make a guess, enter it if you like in the, the chat. The, the best estimate is between six and 9,000 insect larvae are required according to research done by Doug Talamy. And this is a picture of a yard <coughs> that's actually very close to Chicago's O'Hare Field. It's uh, some 50 by 100 foot garden. It's by a lady named Pam Carlson. Uh, she's been um, living there, growing this garden and adding to it with, she's got some 200 species of plant, plants and 60 species of native plants she's added over 25 years. She's identified 103 species of birds in her garden, many of which um, use it as a, for, uh, a source of food and nest nearby or in her garden. So this is one very small garden and it's made a huge impact. Um, <clears throat> this is a list of the genus 
of plants that will host the most caterpillars and oaks are right at the top, uh, then followed by the plums genus, and then uh, the willows, and these are all uh, what are called keystone plants. These are all in our heartwood area. And if you go down to flowering plants, um, Louisiana goldenrod is in the family that has the most. Uh, sunflowers are right behind, and then the mallows also host a number of different species of plants. So it's very important to have <clears throat> these in your garden. So if you're only gonna plant one tree, oak would be a great source. Um, on the other hand, if you wanna have a beautiful pipe uh, vine swallowtail, you ha have to have uh, a food source for it, and that's the pipe vine shown below. And that's the only food source that the pipe vine swallowtail uh, will lay eggs on and it will serve as a host plant. So what are some of the benefits of natives in your yard? yard with it? You have talked about the diversity of wildlife. There's also a benefit of lower maintenance. The plants are adapted to our environment. You'll have biological pest control. You won't need uh, uh, any separate pest control. Uh, they use less concert, uh, water because they're adapted to our environment. And there's a sense of place and season uh, with using native plants. We don't live in uh, New England with a beautiful fall foliage, but we live in an area that has absolutely stunning fall colors. These are all native plants um, and it, taken in one week, uh, uh, three years ago in my yard. Um, I'm sure Lisa could show many more uh, as uh, a beautiful uh, spring and fall colors, and she will show them in her presentation. So that's all a sense of place. And um, I get like to close with what are my reasons? And these are all pictures taken in our yard. Um, the one on the far right, I've actually added to the uh, it with having more native uh, flowers around our pond now, uh, but our reasons are they improve the quality of our life, uh, living with all the abundant nature that's drawn to it, uh, conserves water and money, and is in retirement, that, uh, that's, that's important, and it fundamentally adds to the enjoyment of our home. So those are what my wife and I, Sharon, um, plant natives. So I'll Close that out, and I think I'm right does, at uh, Does anybody have any questions for Mike? If you want, you can unmute your mic and chime in, or if not, that's okay, too. That was a wonderful presentation. Thank you very much. You're welcome. That was my timer ju just went off. I put so I got, got in right under the bell. Perfect, perfect timing, Mike. <clears throat> okay. Well, my uh, computer clock says 947. So why don't uh, we take a restroom break or grab a coffee? And we will start promptly at 10 with Miss Lisa Tuck, who will continue on the, the journey that Mike got us started on. So I will see y'all right at 10 o'clock with Lisa. Mike, I'm gonna go ahead and make you a, not a co-host. Yeah. And I'm gonna go ahead and put Lisa as a co-host. All right, I'll be back in about five minutes before. Yes, sir. All right, see you. Okay, Ms. Ms. Tuck, you are now a co-host. And you're muted. Now you're not muted. <clears throat> so we're going to start, uh, Lisa, my computer says 949. We're going to start right at 10. Oh, with okay. Your, with your stuff. Is that okay? Yeah. Okay. Can you see that? I don't see a thing yet. Oh. Oh, I need to share. Hold on. Correct. Uh, 
Oh, I'm on the wrong one. Just a minute. Send. Down under the click the share screen, and it should bring up a bunch of selections for your background if you have a presentation open. Well, oh, shoot. Now all I can see is Zoom. Just a minute. Hmm. Oh, wait. I'm in the wrong one. Just a minute. Share screen. Share. Ah, I think we're now. I can see your screen. It's not in full mode, but I see your tiles on the left and the main presentation in the middle. Okay, so slideshow. Hmm. Slideshow. Now you got it? Now we got it. Okay. Okay, I'll be back in a sec. Perfect. Thanks. Best way to get to 2338 Park Farm by car is beyond. Okay, they're only 35 minutes from here. Oh, really? Yeah. Oh. In San Antonio. Cool. Yeah, those muffins are really good. In fact, I'll take that one with you. 
good. Lisa, do you want to answer the text that Jessica just sent in, or you want me to? Uh, hold on. Well, I don't know. I can get out of my share thing here. Oh, no, no, no. Uh, what she's asking is uh, they bought an acre in the Sam Houston National Forest. <clears throat> they just uh, cleared underbrush of an acre, and they're trying to remove and reduce invasive species they see in the yard. What's the best way to keep them from repopulating? My, my technique involves a lot of elbow grease. Well, yeah, elbow grease and Roundup. I mean, if they're willing to do Roundup, but. Yeah, I just, uh, I have a, the area that I live in has a Chinese tallow infestation, but I've cleared it off of my lot. Yeah. Uh, I'm not a big fan of Roundup at all oh, anymore, well, especially because I live next to a lake. But what I did per the Texas a and Forest Service, in the invasive species, guys, uh, when I cut these trees down, I drilled holes in the stump and put brush killer herbicide in the holes. Yeah. And that seems to actually ultimately poison and kill them, and it doesn't affect any of the surrounding uh, stuff that's replacing it, like native persimmons and button bushes. Yeah. Stuff. Yeah, that sounds like a, a good plan. There, um, There is a if you have to use Roundup or if they, um, if that doesn't work or whatever for them, then there is one that is water friendly. It's a different, you know, a different chemical. So I'm right. not even sure it's called Roundup, but uh, they're also, you know, Alan Bibo has that um, pellet shooter. Oh no, that's right. I've seen it. With yeah. You. Have you, see, I want to borrow that from him, but he said that it takes like one pellet for um, like for a three. two or something, two or three. Yeah, I think the further to um, the question on invasives removal, the 
the best strategy is to identify the invasive and you're just going to have to pull them and yes. get roots. If you don't want to sit there and chemicalize your yard, uh, I tend to just use the, the labor way. And we just bought two and a half acres up where we're building a house. We had the guy that actually, the, they pulled the yoke pond up, which is overgrown and, and ruins the understory of the pine forest. And then they mulch it. And so I basically got a mulch floor and it's similar to what they do with uh, fire uh, control burning in the yes. Jones forest. And the result is that you get a whole lot of native grasses and beauty berry and stuff that comes up. And then you just have to be diligent of keeping the yoke pond cut out. So unless somebody knows a better way than that, I think it's basically elbow roots. There's a, there's a question on where you get the pellets, the pellets that were referenced. We used to uh, use let me go. Tallow. Let me go back. Was it uh, Chinese tallows? Yeah, there was the pellets. I think Lisa mentioned that one per tree. She said there was a question where where can we get the pellets? Oh uh, well, so the pellets are actually a harder discussion because that's actually a purchase of something and the poison pellets, and that's used by a guy that's the biologist at Sam Houston State University. So. My suspicion, Lisa, correct me if I'm wrong, is that that's not something he'd pass out to any individual. Yeah, you know what? I, that may be correct, Scott. I don't know. He told me I could borrow his pellet shooter. And so then... You're, you're on uh, the inside. <laughs> what's that? You're one of the inside people. Yeah. Well, then my plan was to get a clue on what exactly is in the pellets and, you know, how well they work and all that. And I just never have done it. But I'm, I agree entirely with what Scott said about getting rid of the yopon. I mean, then, like you got to mulch up their roots or something because they'll just keep coming back thicker than ever. Even, you, with, you even if you just burn them, they'll come right. back thicker than ever unless you get those bad boy roots up. You just got to be diligent. And yeah. I can tell you the tallows, even with what I've done, they stick their little heads up out of old stumpy roots and I just keep cutting them down. Yes. Uh, the birds will drop seeds all in the yard and I'll pull up the stuff yes. by the roots. It's just, yes. it's a battle. And when the class actually meets, I'll show them a picture of George Bush Park in West Houston that I like to show everybody. And it used to be an old ranch in the 1900s. So that's behind the Attics and Barker Dam complex. And it's a 98% Chinese tallow now. Yeah, that's the same thing as Armand Bio in the in Clear Lake. Yep. Or Pasadena, I think is technically its address. But I mean, they've been fighting Chinese tallows for, for decades. And, and uh, they we... burned them out and they came back thicker than ever. Before we continue, there was a question that talked about uh, living in a place with heavier clay and what plant species would be better for partial sun and soggy most of the time. That sounds like to me a question for Mike and Lisa. It, it, is, <clears throat> is that, are you looking for perennials, trees, or shrubs? I guess is the question. And so, Partial yeah, it was a it was a chat question, so I don't know, Mike. Yeah, I'm. I'm uh, so I mean, I, I can answer the question on when I was living in West Houston, which was basically living on gumbo clay. All of the trees, like the ones that Randy Lemon likes to promote, were like in the, the swamp oak family, sort of the white oak family. Water they oak. did real well. Uh, yeah, so, I'm gonna go through a bunch of bunch of plants. Yeah, yeah, so maybe it's time late. It's time anyway. So why don't Lisa? Why don't you go ahead and kick it off? Because I think maybe some of these questions get answered, especially with you getting okay. into some more of the core of, <clears throat> core of the presentation that might uh, built the the conversation on. So okay. it's all yours. All right. <laughs> okay. I'm uh, glad y'all are all here. Strap in. Um, <clears throat> Going to go through some of the how to do this stuff and uh, then a lot of the plants. And I'm gonna start with trees and go on down to clover. So I'm gonna give a bunch of examples of plants so y'all can kind of check it out. Um, Scott already introduced us. We all three were in the same intern class in, what year was that? 2016, 2017, whatever year it was. And uh, anyway, I'm really glad to know these guys and that I hope y'all have the same really great um, intern experience once we are you know get back to really doing stuff so anyway let's go 
Okay, so the issue is again, as Mike said, that half the world's land is used to feed humans. So this means a significant loss of habitat for other species, which reduces their chance of survival. Uh, the the catch-22 is that many of the species that are being displaced are the same ones that are necessary to pollinate the food. So what do we do? I need to get rid of this thing over here. Um, well, provide nectar and pollen for the adults and provide host plants for their offspring. So there's like two groups we need to feed here. We need to feed the, the butterflies, moths, the hummingbirds, you know, the, the pollinators, the adults. But then for the insects, we need to provide the host plants. So what the caterpillars are going to eat. Okay. Okay, so what to consider when planting is first what you want to accomplish in that spot. Now for the purposes of this presentation, what we want to accomplish is taking care of our pollinators. Uh, for what you may want to accomplish is having a nice little water garden or having something that's totally irises or having something, I hope that we're gonna have some um, native irises in there if, if that is what you want to accomplish. But anyway, think about what you want to accomplish there. Think about your soil, then how much sun it's gonna get. Turns out there is like a definition for sun, part sun, part shade, double shade and shade. Uh, how much water it's going to get normally and also where the plant normally grows versus where you are. Okay, so again, what we want to accomplish for this is attracting and supporting pollinators. So you can see in this picture on the left, that is actually not a native, that is a, that's a garlic, that's a garlic chive. And this butterfly loves it because a lot of pollinators love the flowers and they, um, there are different herbs too that are pollinator hosts, okay? But the pollinators evolved with native plants and so did, I mean, all insects did. They, they all evolved with the native plants. They need nectar and they may need host plants. Uh, be sure that the pollinator that you're planning for is actually in your area. Um, when I first moved to the Huntsville area and had more garden that I wanted to put in and I was kind of gardening by hoping for the best, but then I started looking at all these lists because I wanted to attract this butterfly or that butterfly and there was one in particular I decided I wanted to attract and so I needed um, each pollinator is specific. They, they are specific for the host plant that their caterpillars will actually eat. So anyway, I needed some plant that I don't remember what it was. And so I told one of my friends that I was going to get that. And she said, oh, I didn't even know that butterfly was in this area. And I stood there a second. And I said, oh, really? Let me get back to you. Well, it turns out that butterfly was actually in Maine. So anyway, be sure that the pollinator that you're planting for is where you are and know when the pollinator is coming through. They, they may need nectar plants in the spring and the fall. So don't limit your garden to just um, one time of year or another. Okay, and again, we're still wanting to uh, attract and support pollinators. Everything that I've read says you need three foot groupings of plants because that's what they see they'll see like uh, three foot of white or three foot of blue or whatever. What I was doing at the very beginning was just kind of dotting plants here and there. And that's not optimum for pollinators. You want diverse bloom times, again, because they don't quit eating at the end of the spring. They need to eat all the time. So diverse bloom times so that they can have the nectar and the pollen. You need a variety of flower shapes and sizes because different pollinators have different uh, proboscis or whatever their mechanism is for getting the, the nectar or for getting the pollen. And so you want a variety of flower shapes. You want diverse colors. Avoid pesticides and plants that are embedded with them. There, uh, this horrifies me, but there are a lot of plants now, particularly at big box stores that they say, oh, guaranteed uh, pest free. Well, that means because they're embedded with a pesticide. And what we want 
is for the bees and the pollinators to be able to go there without dying. It's terribly rude to invite them to dinner and then kill them for eating. So avoid pesticides in the plants that have it. Avoid hybrids. Um, hybrids, they may not even land on a hybrid. Um, and include natives in your garden, because again, going back to that's what they all evolved with. Okay, soil can be a challenge. Unless you're planting in a pasture or your house was built before 1960, you may not have native soil. Uh, foundations are typically built on or in clay and new building codes can require higher elevation. So if you see this picture right here, you see that little ramp goes down. My sister for a brief period had um, a three story vertical living house inside the loop in Houston. And there were four of them that were together on what had formerly been, you know, a 1960s house. And um, anyway, this was at the end of theirs. And you see that there's a foot difference. That's because the building code changed between when her house was built in like 2017 and when that house next door where that car is parked was built in 1960. And it had changed a foot even there, you know, way, way inside the loop. And, and so not where it would typically flood, but that's where the building code changed. And just so, just on that same topic, you'll see a lot of times where um, a developer just levels all of the trees in a certain area, and then you have all this clay brought in. There are only certain places where, like in the woodlands, they didn't have to do that because there was no building code there that required an elevation change change but if the elevation was previously 10 feet above sea level and now it's 12 they're going to have to bring in two feet of dirt they can't save any trees doing that um, whether they want to or not most of them aren't going to want to because it's so much more expensive but even if they did they couldn't because you can't put more than like two inches of uh, soil on tree roots and have them survive it okay so and i did build in a pasture so, and even if you're in a pasture, you may not have native soil because this dump truck on the left, the red one, dumping all that clay, that was for the foundation of my house uh, because we built kind of on a, a little baby hill, you know, a little hump. And so in order to level it out for the foundation of the house, we ended up having to bring in quite a bit of clay. And then I, being a soil scientist, had uh, told them they needed to get a sheep's foot in order to compact it. So they needed a lot of clay. So then if you look on the right, see, and what the guy did, see the, um, the dirt that's in front of the dump truck, that's kind of the, the grayish color, and then the clay is the red behind it. The grayish soil is the top soil because he moved it, he uh, bulldozed it away. And then after he got the foundation done, then he spread my top soil back out in my yard. But now right around the house where I was making flower beds you can see i only went down like one that's a little baby that's a hand spade so that's probably only six inches deep before i hit all that clay so be aware on your soil that you may not be in native soil i wasn't even in native soil and i was in a pasture and then i uh and in a subdivision it's it maybe right around your house is purchased topsoil or, you know, no, no telling, but very likely not native. Although in a subdivision, they only bring in clay as much as like as little as they have to, or as little as they can. So it's going to go typically like right almost to the edge of your house. And but still, even if it goes out a foot or two, it's going to encompass your flower beds right, a, right around your house. Okay, so again, back to my house. This is uh, my husband who um, graciously got in there for scale. And so this tree uh, was planted mm, probably a hundred feet from the house and, and the, tree on, the tree on the left, so beyond the imported clay, the tree on the right was planted at exactly the same time, exactly 
the same time, but it is much closer to the house. It loses its leaves long before the others. I uh, told y'all at the very beginning, I was doing gardening by hoping for the best. And I didn't know exactly how to plant these things, like to dig a really, really deep hole, like with my, um, you know, post hole digger on the tractor or something, and then fill it in with some other kind of mostly native soil and then put the tree in. And I suspect that for the tree on the right, its little roots are just circling around in that clay and I'm gonna have to take it out uh, before it's all over with. So what does this mean? You can and should still plant natives. And if you have an extra six inches of clays, clay, no worries. Uh, natives typically have deep roots. Just dig below the clay and ensure the roots go there. Don't do what I did with the tree on the right. And then fill in with a mix of the clay you just dug up and native soil or as close as you can get to native soil. If you just put, if you don't use the clay that you just dug up, you just put um, the native soil or the, you know, soil that you know the plant's gonna like, then the plant roots are just gonna stay there because the roots are just gonna go, oh, I love this, I love this, and it's not gonna wanna try and get out into the clay. So you want to use the mix, okay? If you have several feet, of non-native clay, that's more challenging. There are two schools on uh, the hole that you're gonna dig for the plant. One is the um, dirt doctor, oh shoot, drawn a blank on the guy's name. But anyway, he says dig an ugly hole. So you dig a bigger, deeper, uglier hole. Or another um, school of thought on it is to dig a hole exactly the size of the pot. Um, and if you do that, then it has to go outside because it's got to go into the clay. Um, the critical part is to give the water a place to go. Otherwise, it's just gonna be sitting in a bowl because the, um, the hole that you dug is gonna, if it's just straight clay around it, it's gonna hold water. And so it's gonna be, it's gonna think New Orleans. Uh, your tree, your plant or whatever is gonna be sitting in a place where it's just gonna drown. And so you um, give it a channel to go out. You've got to give the water a place to go. And then again, you fill in with a mix of the clay you just dug up and native soil. So does anybody have any questions? So far? Okay, go on. Okay. Soil also, okay, this is going back to my sister's um, three story vertical living house inside the loop. Okay, and there were four of them together. This was the lady exactly to her right. So the lady that was on the corner. And so I'm showing you this, even though um, these plants aren't necessarily native, but the potential for using natives were limitless here. And it would have been really, really easy to do. One thing that was really stunning about this flower bed that she did, y'all see all those river rocks down there? She put them over on their side. I mean, it, it was amazing. It was very nice looking. Okay, then inside her fence, that's right behind the vitex there. So then you go in there and this is inside the yard. She didn't want to mow because she had this long thing. So this was a big yard there. And uh, she put down AstroTurf. But then what she did was have all of these really nice flower pots and uh and then again you could put natives there you can put succulents you could put whatever it is that you like and um i mean it, i mean again the potential is endless these i loved these were hanging on her back or her fence in fact in the picture on the far right you can see them way at the back but these are very lightweight because she uh, like stuffed them with moss and then stuffed the plants in there. And so they hung, they grew and hung down her fence. And again, you can put any kind of plant in there that you like. I had given her a Texas star hibiscus and she put it in this nice little pot and then put it right in front of, uh, well, to, to the right of her, her uh, well, no, this was between her house and my sister's house. So right in between there was where this guy went. Okay, now on sun versus shade, the tricky part is you, you buy a plant at a nursery and it says it'll take full sun. 
the definition of full sun is six hours per day. So full sun is six hours per day. What do we get? 14? So some plants will take that, some not. Um, Lantana will take 14. Some others that say full sun when you buy them won't. So keep in mind, full sun means six hours a day. Part sun, three to six. Part shade, two to four. Dappled shade comes through trees or a filter, and shade is no more than two hours a day. Okay, vegetables may need eight to 10 hours of direct sun all day. Flower gardens, not so much. Um, you want your tomatoes to get as much sun as possible, so you plant them where they're just gonna be in sun. Um, also keep in mind that the plants may need full sun to set the buds and flower, but then they don't need the heat or the dry conditions that come with it. So if you have a place that just has morning sun, try that, or just has evening sun, then try that. If it's something that, that really says full sun, hopefully you can get it to where it's just evening. But again, there are some that are truly hardy, like the lantanas or uh, flame acanthas or, well, now I'm drawing a blank. But anyway, some of the other ones that really can take that much sun. Okay, and this, Reference down here is where I found the definition, the best definition that I found the easiest to read of what is full sun, partial shade, and all that. Okay, so here's the top picture is I have like, since I built in the middle of a pasture, I have zero shade. Uh, well, maybe I have six square inches or something. So anyway, uh, at the end of my, um, um, well, it was formerly a water house. Now it's like a little workshop, but that's like the one place that have any shade whatsoever because it gets shade after, it only gets morning sun there. So I planted ginger there. The pigeonberry loves it there. Uh, it's enough shade for it. It's at the edge of where I had uh, brought in the clay. So it has a clay substrate. So what I did on the left-hand side of that, I ended up putting in a French drain to give the water a place to go so that I don't kill everything in there. And then I dug it out like a foot and put in some really good soil, but I gave the water a place to go. So then the picture below that is where my sister was before she lived in the place inside the loop. So this was when she was in League City. And you see all those uh, elephant ears. And then back behind that is ginger. Her ginger grew to be 10 feet tall and these beautiful flowers on it and going out, oh, it was just staggering. And it loved it there. You can see the ginger in the top picture, that was mine. You know, it's just, yeah, well, I can survive it, but I don't really like it here. But it just needs more shade than I was able to give it. So down here where it really loved it, it's, it's staggering. So the point is, um, figure out where you want to plant. And then, because there are certain plants that meet all of the requirements that you have in that spot. Okay, so any questions about that? Okay, then let's go on to water. So another thing to consider is how much water does the spot get? Because you need to select the plant that is suited to the water and the sun levels. A lot of times you'll hear that get natives because you don't have to water them. Well, and from my point of view, that's not really correct because it depends on the native. If you put a native that needs a lot of water in a place where it's not gonna get it, you're gonna have to water. Uh, there's a reason there's something called a swamp sunflower. How much water do you think that bad boy needs? Well, quite a bit. And so you don't want to plant it next to a cactus because Oh, that's another thing. And you want to plant them um, where uh, in the same amount of water and sun requirements. So make sure that when you're planting all your stuff, that if it requires a little bit of water, plant it next to something that also requires a little bit of water. Because if you have to water uh, something a lot just to keep it alive, then it is, um, it's not gonna go well. Um, Okay, so let's see. And you might need to water even low water net natives while they're being established if you have zero shade, so they get 10 plus hours of sun or during a drought. Just be aware. 
But again, natives typically have much longer roots. They're going to do better, and they're also going to uh, attract your pollinators. These, uh, the, almost all of these pictures are from my yard. This one on the left is from my yard. Um, okay, more thoughts on native, define native. Um, also, is the plant native to your area of Texas, or does it only grow in Big Bend? This is something that I find completely annoying in going to native plant cells is that whoever's in charge of purchasing whatever plants it is they're going to sell there um, gets plants that are really endemic to Big Bend or far west Texas or far north Texas or something and so it won't grow in my yard. I can't tell you the number of plants that I bought before I figured that out. And so now, anytime I see something that says native, I look up to see what its native range is because I don't want to. I don't want to work that hard, and I don't want this poor plant to die a slow, torturous death in my yard. Also, it may be a cultivar of the true native, and that may be okay. And but for me, I'm I'm looking for the real deal, and so I don't want to. I don't. I may not want a cultivar. Also, since we're talking about pollinators and what um, a pollinator needs for its, for its babies, for the caterpillars, remember that many herbs are host plants. So consider having herbs as well as natives in your garden. Um, for whatever pollinator it is that you want to attract and that you want to support, then look at what its host plants are because the and what its um, favorite um, pollen and nectar plants are because that the pollen and nectar are going to feed the adults and the host plants are going to feed the babies okay. okay so this is my butterfly garden the first this was the first year that i did it and i was just really pleased, really pleased with it. I, uh, it's gorgeous and uh, and now it's it's still that shape, you know, this big S, it's like 60 feet long or something. Anyway, so I still have this big S, but that first year I had Black-Eyed Susan, Brown-Eyed Susan, Confederate Daisy, Vervain, Milkweed, Columbine, Mexican Hat, Zinnias, which were not native. I had a Mealy Blue Sage. I had some um, herbs in there. So I had dill, parsley, and basil. You can see some dill on the far left and there's some, I had like three big dill plants in there. Well, check this. Okay, since I was all that, you know, I, this was my butterfly garden. I had 43 swallowtail caterpillars on my dill plants. I ended up having to move like a few of them from one dill plant to another to make sure they survived it because they were eating those bad boys down to to nothing and uh, oh it was so exciting so exciting and um anyway it was uh i still love this picture okay and then check this going back to my sister's house in league city okay this was my sister's unintentional one plant butterfly garden okay she had six swallowtail caterpillars say those swallowtails same same swallowtail right here uh, on parsley. What she had were like these um, pots alongside her garage there when she lived in Lake City, so the place that had the really cool ginger. Anyway, so I would get over there one day and I see, I went out and I said, uh, oh my gosh, Linda, you've got like six swallowtail caterpillars on your parsley. And she said, oh, do I need to spray it? And I'm no, no, no. And um, anyway, but my point is that even one plant even one plant will help support your pollinators. She didn't mean to do this at all. I said, look, Linda, leave the, leave the swallowtail caterpillars and I will go to HEB and get you some parsley. And um, anyway, but even one plant will help. So my goal on um, a lot on native plants is I'm trying to mainstream them. So if I can get everybody that I know to put two or three or four or five native plants in their gardens, even if their sole thing is all I want in my house or daylilies and caladiums. Well, you know, let's, along the back, let's put these five natives. Then it's going to help the pollinators. That's totally my thing. Okay, so 
Uh, do we have any questions? Do I need to be looking at these things, Scott? It keeps it's po popping up that there are 26 things. Uh, no, I think yeah. classmates are answering and Mike's answering, and I chipped oh, in a little bit with my little bit of knowledge. Okay. Go, go for okay. it. Okay, press on. Okay, thanks. Okay, so first, and, and I said I'm going to go from trees on down to um, clover. So, um, most of these trees are like what we have in, you know, East Texas down where I am, north of Huntsville, where y'all are, are north of Huntsville down to the Houston area. I grew up in Baytown. I lived in Dickinson in Galveston County for 20 years. I've been in Huntsville for eight years. And this is where my heart is. And this, this is what I know best. Okay, so a black tupelo. Uh, and what and when I was doing this presentation, I was like, obsessed and so I looked up every single plant that I put in here on like uh, several websites so that I, and I put like special value to honeybees and and who eats them uh, or what you know what their host plants for so anyway it's it's all right here also where I could put a picture of the plant like the and with the leaves and also the flowers so you could see the the flowering and the pollen okay so a black tupelo, special value to honeybees, and its fruit is consumed by many birds and mammals. American sweet gum, a lot of people believe this to be a trash tree. Well, you know what? Luna, luna moths love it. And if you can see in the top right, that is actually a luna moth pupa that I found in my yard in an oak tree. So once that luna moth laid its eggs, you know, on this sweet gum, then it got done with that and then crawled over to the oak tree and then became a little moth. So very cool. And then in the like lower right, I guess is the, um, you know, the flowers. It's also a nesting site and fruit for birds and mammals. Okay, tree on the left, drum and red maple. It's a, a larval host to many sphinx moths. A lot of people don't like those. I, I think that a tomato hornworm is one, is a sphinx something. Uh, but anyway, it has seeds that are food for many birds and squirrels. The uh, deers eat this. So if you have a deer issue, you may not want a drum and red maple. Uh, box elder maple, larval host for other, for silk moths, special value to honey bees, attracts birds. Okay. Mike had said earlier on his, his chart about the species, oaks, oaks, virtually any species of oaks. They attract songbirds, ground birds, and mammals. Their substrate is used by insectivorous birds. The nuts and pollen provide food for wildlife. They're a nesting and cover site. They're just, they're, or they are larval hosts for just a plethora of species. Uh, I just listed 10 butterflies here. Uh, but there are many, 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 many species that oaks are larval hosts for. So again, if you can plant one tree, well, I would say it's between an, an oak and a black cherry, but uh, plant an oak. They're really easy to grow and the pollinators will love you. Okay, on the left is the native fringe tree. I love these. Southern Living cause, uh, had an article that uh, was entitled The Fringe Tree, The Best Native Tree Nobody Grows. It's a larval host to several moths. The fruits are eaten by birds, deer and other animals brown on the foliage, small rodents may eat the hardened seeds, and it's just a beautiful, beautiful tree. The black cherry, the fruit is consumed by 33 bird species and mammals. The wilted leaves may be harmful to livestock. It's a special, native a special value to every bee and it's a laurel host to many things i just planted a, a black cherry i finally found a black cherry and planted it around my cabin i'm i'm so excited so plant a black cherry and plant an oak mexican plum i planted a bunch of these around my cabin too one of our our um, master naturalist buddies works at um Lone Star College in Conroe, and they have Mexican plums in their flower beds around their building, and they drop all these little seeds. And so um, I went there and dug up, I don't know, 
50 of them or something, which I'm going to do again this next year and just grew them until they were big enough to put in the ground. So Mexican plums um, are a larval host to a swall another swallowtail and different moths. Flowering dogwood, larval host to a spring azure and special value to native bees. Eastern redbud, uh, special value to bees, provides nesting material. The tulip poplar, I don't have one of these and I want one. They're a uh, larval host and special value to honeybees. And I just, I love those flowers. So I'm gonna find one of these. Okay, parsley hawthorn. I've got a gazillion of these out in the, the woods around my house. I'm actually, one of my friends has put in a native bed and I'm gonna, I've got three different ones tagged of different sizes so I can give her one. Um, special value to native bees. They have these nice, this nice fruit that uh, the mammals and birds eat. Honey locust, I've got a ton of these in our forest too. And they're also a, a larval host and cover and nesting sites for birds. They're really good nesting sites. They've got these little thorns and so they're very protective. Okay, you see this vitex on the left and you say, oh, why would you have that? That's certainly not native. Uh, well, pollinators love it. I have one at the end of my porch and when I go out there and drink coffee in the spring, particularly when it's really flowering, then all, all you hear is because it's just covered covered in bees and moths and butterflies and, and um, hummingbirds, any kind of pollinator there is. Ah, but you say it's on several invasives list. Well, guess what? It's also a Texas superstar. So the Vitex, it depends on who you talk to. Um, Texas A&M is now has like a little footnote that says there has been one study that says that these may be um, invasive along um, like the Edwards Plateau where they, you know, the seeds get into the creeks or whatever and then during a flood they go on down. I've never had a problem with them. When I first planted them, a forester had told me that they were native and I was totally okay with that, but I have never had them appear anywhere else from where I planted them. So, you know, you decide whether you like them or, or hate them or somewhere in between. But I tell you, they are pollinator magnets. Possum Hall, this is one of my very, very favorites just because it is so beautiful in the winter. This is a deciduous holly. And so what happens is that the, um, the leaves fall off and all of these little berries, they're uh, all along the, the stems and the trunks and they're right up against it. And there are this many of them. And so it's like this all winter. And then all of a sudden in the spring, like a group of red birds or um, red birds cardinals, you know, come, come along. And then all of a sudden in like 30 seconds, every single berry is gone, but it's in the spring and it's about to start, you know, leaf out again. But uh, I love the possum hole. I've got a few of these on our property that I found that are native and after I'd already paid good money for them. Uh, but uh, anyway, I, I, I love these. But anyway, my point was, of course they're native, even, even the ones I bought were native, but I, I wouldn't have had to buy them. I would have just had to go dig them up had I known they were there to begin with. Okay, Hercules Club. I have uh, some of these on our property. Actually, this picture was from my property. And um, it's a larval host for a giant swallowtail. I confess I have not seen the giant swallowtail on my property. I saw this uh, giant swallowtail on, one of my girlfriend's houses who lives a few miles from me, but I haven't seen one on mine. The uh, sassafras, I have a lot of these too. And it's a larval host for a, a, a different swallowtails and, um, and a silk moth. It's a nectar source, birds eat the fruit. What I love about a sassafras, and it, it kind of wants to be an understory tree. It, um, it doesn't need a, a whole lot of sun, but it's got three different shaped leaves on the same tree. So some of them are like this trident that you see, some of them look like mittens, and some of them look like just a regular leaf, you know, an oval with a point, you know. Okay, now we're going to go into shrubs. Does anybody have any questions about trees? Okay, moving on. Okay, a Virginia sweet spire. This um, 
I just bought one of these and sadly before I uh, was able to get it planted, my uh, husband's cows ate most of it. So I'm not entirely sure if it's gonna come back. But um, anyway, um, it attracts birds. It's used for cover and nectar, used for erosion control. It's very showy. Um, I, I hope that I'm gonna, I'm gonna buy another one. Um, I found a place that's way far away from me, but at least I can go and get some native plants. Okay, on the right is a white honeysuckle, special value to bumblebees. Deers like it. So it's a central Texas native, but um, actually uh, Diana Foss sent this one to me as something that we should grow here because she said, even though it's central Texas, it will grow here and it is covered in bees through the winter. So again, let's not quit feeding our pollinators right at the end of spring. Let's keep going so that they can keep going. So this is one option for that. Okay, this plant I love, love, love. The picture on the, it's a coral bean. I love it, love it, love it. Beans uh, are poisonous to humans. I've I've never even seen any beans on, on any of these. The ones on, on the right, well, the far right, that was from the plant on the left. It was in my yard. But the one at the bottom actually found coral beans growing in the utility easement after I had already paid good money for this one down at Buchanan's in Houston. And what I discovered is you see this one that's kind of in, that's in the middle? That is how big that they get, like, in nature where it's gonna not get in watered and still it's just beautiful. And that's kind of what I was expecting. Well, the one on the left, since I was watering it and it loved where it was, where it was got to be, I, I had to trim it down to 12 feet in diameter and 12 feet tall. I had no idea that it would get that big, period. And it was beautiful, but I finally had to dig it up because it got, I couldn't walk up and down on the sidewalk. And it was, you know, was just taking over the, the whole thing. So anyway, that's one thing about a plant. Be aware that when you plant it, if it really, really, really loves it, where you put it, it may get bigger than what it said on the little sticker that came with it. So um, I, again, I did not expect a coral bean ever to get 12 by 12 when I trimmed it. I expected three feet wide and maybe three or four feet tall. And so just be aware. Okay, uh, Esperanza or yellow bells, uh, also called Tacoma stands. You can find this almost anywhere. And there's this little skipper butterfly on it. This is from my yard. And um, it's a laurel host to a, to a plebeian sphinx, but it also, that it's a nectar source for everybody. Everybody loves the uh, Tacoma stands, I mean, and they're easy. Mine dies to the ground every every winter where I am. Um, I'm north of Huntsville, but I'm also in like a little shallow valley. So if it says that it's um, 42 degrees in Huntsville, it's likely to be 34 at my house. And so I, I get way more days below freezing at my house than they do in Huntsville. Way, way more than I did in Dickinson. In the Houston area, these things can get 15 feet tall and they don't die back during the winter. Okay, then the next one on the right, American Beautyberry. This wants to be an understory tree. This one I actually planted in my yard. I planted a couple of them right in my, at the, end of, the other end of my porch from the Vitex and I water them. So since I water them, uh, they, they get all these berries. And so then once they start producing berries, then I make sure to keep them watered so that I, I have, you know, it's just a profusion of, of these beautiful purple berries. Although even, even with that, I don't have to water them that much because they, they get mostly morning sun there. So they're, they're good. Okay, on the left, rock rose. Uh, this is a central Texas plant, but I grow, these are easy to grow. They'll pop up. Uh, any, they pop up a bunch of different places and uh, pollinators love them. And I have one, I, in fact, I should have changed this picture. I have one in my butterfly garden right now that is about four feet in diameter 
and, um, and about three feet tall, and it, it's more like a mound. This is one that was growing like out in the woods, and so it just grows any way that it can. The one on the right is not a native, it's a Duranta. I love it because pollinators love it. A lot of pollinator pictures that I have are on this plant, and so it is a great nectar source. Um, it does readily spread, so not anything like a, a turf's cap or anything, but it will, like in the probably eight years that I've had this plant, it's popped up in like two or three other places. So I guess, you know, that's not too bad a spread, but still, I, I really like this plant for the, because the pollinators love it. And it has changed um, species names since I originally bought it. Okay, the one on the left, Texas Lantana. Pollinators love it. It's uh, pretty much deer proof. So if you have a deer problem, plant this. And uh, the Texas, land, the native Lantana is just um, not quite so cold hardy as some of the, the other Lantanas that have been produced since then. There's another Lantana called Texas Gold that is, you'll see it a lot in like subdivisions because it's real low growing and it kind of mounds and so they'll have like a whole flower bed with nothing but that in it. And it, it's really pretty too. And pollinators love it also. Um, the one on the right is the flame acanthus. I love this. It's a pollinator magnet. You'll see that's also in my yard. That was a, I guess that's a sulfur something, something butterfly. And uh, I, I don't know butterflies very well at all. But anyway, both of, both of these pictures were, were in my yard. It's a summer bloomer. It's still blooming. And the flowers attract hummingbirds and butterflies. Okay, on the left, button bush. This one is going to like, uh, is, will love water. It'll grow other places. It loves water. It's a larval host. Um, the, your livestock won't eat it. Okay, and those, that, uh, the one on the left, this picture I found, and it has like the, the purple balls. And then I also found a picture of a white ball. And so I don't know if that's a different species or not, but I thought it was pretty. Okay, the one on the right is the Turk's cap. Turk's cap will pop up everywhere. This one was in my yard. It just, I got a close up of the flower. But pollinators love this one too. This one really, really, really does spread. You have to, you have to keep an eye on it. Okay, shrubs. These are all different varieties of viburnums. I've, uh, I confess I have uh, rusty black haw viburnum is supposed to be the one that we can really grow well in uh, East Texas in the Huntsville area and I haven't been able to grow one at all, ever. And I don't know if it's because of the clay around my house or if it just hates me. But anyway, I haven't been able to grow one. Arrowwood, I grew for a while, but I, I needed to move it out of the clay. And maple leaf, I've, I've never tried. Okay, vines, uh, a pipe vine, Mike had mentioned earlier that again, every single insect, every single uh, of the insect pollinator species uh, are specialists. So if you want, everybody knows that if you want monarchs, you need to have milkweed or queens. Um, if you want a pipe vine swallowtail, you need to have a pipe vine plant. Uh, there are no, there's like one native pipe vine that's kind of hard to find, but it's, it's not native to Texas, but it is native to the U.S. Usually what you can find is this one on the far left, and I think it's from Brazil, and it's a little bitty baby vine, and it, uh, it, it is low growing, it goes along the ground. All of these pictures and the one on the left uh, were from my friend Jean's yard, and uh, we act, they actually had a pipe, a pipe vine caterpillar handoff because they totally ate every single scrap of her pipe vine, and she collected all the caterpillars and took them over to Rhonda's house so that they could survive to make butterflies. So there is a caterpillar network, just so you know. Okay, um, anyway, so again, if you want a particular pollinator, you need to have its host plant if you want the babies. Okay, coral honeysuckle vine. This was from my woods. It's a horrible host to um, different things, special value to honeybees. It, the fruit 
tracks, all kind of stuff. Okay, look at the one on the right. Okay, this is a Carolina jessamine. The flowers attract native honeybees. Oh, and when I'm looking all these up, again, you know, I'm on like three different websites, looking at all the stuff, making sure that I have all the information correct. It's a mainstay. This is what it said on wildlife, wildflower.org, you know, Lady Bird Johnson thing. Okay, it says it's a mainstay of the suburban landscape and reaches 10 to 20 feet. Then the next thing it said was, oh, the flowers, leaves, and roots are poisonous and are toxic or lethal to humans and livestock if consumed. The nectar is toxic to honeybees if consumed in sufficient quantities. Honey produced from its nectar may be toxic to humans. And I'm going, oh, how many people do I know in the homeschool area that are beekeepers? And I'm going, oh my gosh, oh my gosh, oh my gosh. Well, that's kind of a nixie for me. So anyway, I had just bought one of these that I was going to plant and I destroyed it because I'm not even going to mess with this. So again, you can find this one in any nursery. And depending on what you want, go back to the what, what are you wanting to accomplish here? If you're a beekeeper, I don't recommend this one, or at least not only having this for your bees to go to. Um, so I'm just totally doing away with it for me. <coughs> okay, I'm gonna buzz through these next few. Okay, cross vine, it's beautiful. Um, this is one that it's real easy to find a cultivar instead of the real thing. So, Depend, it depends on what you want. Oh, also notice on some of these, on, on the vines, I put how long they get. So like the cross vine can get to 50 feet. So if you want something that's gonna go up over a pergola, this may be a good choice for you. Also this trumpet vine. Um, there are some of them like, I can't remember, I think it may have been the trumpet vine, that um, now a lot of um, uh, gardeners say, no, you don't want this because it's gonna take over everything. So. Oh yeah, this, I think this is. Although rapid colonization by suckers can make it a nuisance, it's useful for erosion control. But this is one that you really, really, really have to um, watch out for because it will spread everywhere. I'm not sure I'm gonna plant trumpet vines either just for that reason, because I don't wanna have to work that hard when there are other vines that I could use that aren't gonna be nearly so aggressive. Oh, and there's a, a, a um, Verbiage you'll hear aggressive and invasive. Aggressive is typically used for a native that tends to spread like this. And invasive is a non-native that spreads. Okay, I want one of these. This blue jasmine, I want this. And it only gets six to 10 feet tall. Okay, Alamo vine, six to 12 feet. But it also can be very aggressive. This I want. I've been able to find uh, non-native passion vines, but I want one of these native species and I have not found them yet. And they're smaller than some of the other vines, but it is a larval host to, to the all kinds of fritillaries and hair streaks. And, and it's just beautiful, beautiful, beautiful flowers. Perennials, these are from, uh, well, the, the two on the left are from my yard. I'm not, I don't remember where I got that right hand picture. But anyway, the giant coneflower is actually not, uh, it's not an echinacea, it's not a coneflower. It's a Rigbeckia. So what it really is, it's a giant uh, black eyed season. The purple coneflower on the right is an echinacea. And uh, you can tell, I mean, the, uh, the pollinators love it, bees love it. This is one of my favorites, Greg's Blue Mist Flower, or just Blue Mist Flower. Greg was a guy that um, he, um, and this is in my yard, so with all these hair streaks and everything on it. But anyway, the, uh, Greg was a guy that he named a lot of species, and so a lot of his will be called Greg's. Um, special value to bees. Uh, also, this is one thing that I had never seen. It supports cons conservation biological control. So it's a plant that attracts predatory insects that prey upon pest insects. And I'm going, oh, woohoo. Okay, so I love, I love this plant. This one will tend to get tall and then kind of fall over. But if you just trim it back, it'll, it'll keep coming back year after year. And then eventually, you know, you'll have to, have to plant new ones. Mealy blue sage on the left, great one. Lance leaf coreopsis or tick seed. Uh, I'll buy these seeds from um, the native plant, Native American Seeds Injunction, and just throw them out in the pasture. 
although quite frankly the coreopsis just grows down my road now i'm not going to be throwing out any more seeds <coughs> black-eyed susan is another rudbeckia i'd said that giant coneflower was uh, just a giant black-eyed susan blackfoot daisy i haven't had that much luck with these i think that they're um more specific to central texas but they're just nice little little bitty flowers mexican hat nice this they are easy to grow easy to grow okay the heartleaf skull cap is um, a native that is very nice and easy to grow it's in the mint family so beware be aware that once you have it it's going to spread okay these were some of my girlfriends so this was my attempt at a blue blue bonnet patch well yeah it's about as good as it got the um, aromatic aster is one that I don't have yet and I'm going to because I think it's so beautiful and this is a fall bloomer. Uh, Gulf Coast uh, Penstemon, this one also will go everywhere. So one, these are beautiful, they're spring bloomers and uh, but they'll go everywhere. If you plant it with the columbine, that's a beautiful combo. If you want something, uh, remember earlier I said, figure out how much water the plant needs and plant accordingly, how much water and how much sun. Both of these are water lovers. The Texas spider lily and the American water willow. Swamp sunflower, again, wants a lot of water. I uh, threw out some seeds for these around our pond. Fall obedient plant, I love these, I love these. And if you water them, they'll actually bloom earlier, but um, they're just nice plants. I just put a bunch of different clovers up here. Every single one of these said they were special value to native bees, special value to mumble bees, and special value to honeybees. Here are some of my favorite books. The Wasowskis, Talamy, anything by that. Oh, Howard Garrett, that's the guy that says dig an ugly hole, the dirt doctor. Um, Let's see, so wrapping it up. So the pollinators evolved with natives as did other insects. They need nectar plants and host plants. Choose the plant to suit your purpose. You may not have native, native soil, but you can still plant natives. Pollinators and other wildlife will thank you. Some plants, including natives, need lots of sun and lots of water. Some don't plant accordingly. Ensure the pollinator and the plant is native to your area. Oh, this little mimosa thing on the left was something that I found on our property and I love it. I'm gonna go dig some up and put some in my flower bed. Okay, any questions? Scott, are we done? I, uh, I think so. Okay. So while you've been busy presenting, Sorry, I moved outside a little bit. While you've been busy presenting, Mike has been uh, busy answering questions and providing some Yay. information to everybody on where to get native plants and on Mercer Arboretum and stuff. So <clears throat> I guess for the group, uh, thanks for everybody joining in. And uh, <clears throat> as always, thanks to Mike and Lisa for the superb job they do on presenting native plants to everyone. And I hope this gives you sort of a glimpse and a taste of what the regular training looks like because it'd be a bit more interactive. There'd be more examples. There'd be stuff that we could do in a classroom. So uh, unless anybody has anything else, I think we hit the time slot targeted. And uh, does anybody want to chime in? Got anything else? I don't see any further questions. I, well, Lisa, um, yeah. you, were, you were looking for... Uh, Passiflora plants. Mercer's having their virtual sale this week weekend. Okay. Uh, I put a in the comments. It's out there. They only have two. They have the Maypop or Incarnata, and they have something called Moriana. And I'm not sure whether that's a native or not. But there are a couple Passifloras that okay. uh, you can uh, buy them online. If you want me to pick them up for you, I can get them next week. So. Oh, okay. Refresh my memories. The passive for the um, passion. Yeah, passion. passion flower. Flower. Okay. Yeah, yeah passion. Flower. Yeah, if either one of them is native, then I would love one. Yeah, the incarnata is. It's also known as maypop, but yeah, okay. they, that, yeah, yes. that one I know is. Yeah. Hey, yeah, I'd love it, Mike. Thank you. Sure.
And for everybody's benefit, I also recorded this, and no, I don't exactly know how to uh, <laughs> retain that and send you a link to where you can view all this again, should you choose to. I'll get with the real president, Carolyn Langlinay, even though I'm using her label for the Zoom meeting, and see if we can pass that off to everybody, including those in the class that could not make it. So uh, with that being said, uh, let's sign off, and thanks for dropping in today. And Mike and Lisa, thanks again. Uh, I enjoy it every time I get to see it. <laughs> Good thing. Yeah. Thank you. Right. Thanks, guys. Thanks, thanks okay, Mike. Okay, guys. Thanks, everybody. Uh, Glad you all here. Everybody in the class, if you have any questions, all you got to do is email me at Heartwood Training, and I'll be glad to see what we can get answered. So thanks, and I'll talk to you all soon.